Thanks everyone. Um, Lake was doing the tool stuff, I'm doing the short stuff. So we're going to get right into it. As mentioned, we're looking at loads on low-rise buildings. So typically as what Lake was showing some of that smoke flows, we've got windows that's coming into the side of the house or that shed or a low-rise building going up over the roof and causing us these suctions on the area there. Now as Lake was pointing out with these vortices, they're coming off on different, if this is a cornering wind coming in, we can see these suctions starting to develop. And if it's a pitched roof, we actually get some higher suctions on the leeward edge, as you would see from your as 1170 work of being wind loads and stands. But so you can see the higher local pressure zones occurring here and fluctuating over there. The other one is how quickly the fluctuations are happening and how they progress down along the roof area. So we're looking at not only the peak loads, but these loads over time giving us additional fatigue loading in our cladding elements. Of course, all of that gets then codified into 1170 or other standards, so we can see where we have representations of the higher peaks in these corner zones, as well as the winds pushing on the windward wall and suction on the leeward wall. If, of course, we have the dominant opening, that pressure instantaneously enters into the building space, as Leighton was talking about, doubling, potentially doubling the load on the structure. So for, for people that use AS4055, the wind loads for housing, this is the design criteria that you'd be using for. It is depending on how you interpret AS 1170 in terms of internal pressure for your shed design or other types of buildings. Depends whether you have uh, protected openings, the right roller doors, and all those things. But basically, it's a false economy if you're doing anything other than designing for full internal pressure. Oops. And we can talk about some of the damage investigation stuff later. In terms of our building code, 1170 gives us our wind loading map. So within Townsville, where I am, over here, and where that red 70 is, I'm going to talk about two uh, cyclone events, Cyclone Debbie and Cyclone Marcia, that are all slightly south of Townsville. Uh, cyclone Marcia was around the Rockhampton area, and Cyclone Debbie was the Ely Beach with Sunday area. So that was, uh, Rockhampton's about six, seven, eight hours drive south of Townsville and uh, Ellie Beach is about three hours drive south of Townsville. One of the things within all of this, within our National Construction Code, it's basically giving us our tenants as well we're here to be designed for. So make sure our building stays upright, doesn't hurt anyone, or nothing from the building goes and hits somebody else's building. The other thing that we've got with the National Construction Code is that it's giving us our minimum design standards. So the rules that we're applying or going through, if we say we're designing for our 70 meters per second, our one in 500 annual probability, which to be honest, I've got no idea what it really means. But if we change it around, that's a 10% chance in 50 years that the wind speed will be exceeded. So that's what our minimum requirement is. So all our homeowners and developers and everything else are looking at that as our bare minimum and thinking that's excellent, we've made it to the standard. Well, congratulations, that's the bare minimum we've all done it to. That's like having our AM, FM radio in our car as opposed to our Bluetooth and 37 airbags and all the rest of it. It's a real thing that most homeowners and developers and things like that really don't appreciate that this is just the, the first line in the sand. And we can build stronger or faster or better if, if we want to. So in terms of having these minimum design standards in our building codes, we still see stuff that goes wrong. So it's Cyclone Yazi or Perth Thunderstorm, shout out to Cyclone Yazi as well. So what's going on? Was it our minimum design criteria exceeded? So was the wind speed st stronger than that, that design criteria level? Was it the correct implication and implementation of the design standard? Was it built the right way using the right stuff? which is basically where it comes into your damage surveys. So in terms of damage surveys, we go out and look at what's done right and what's done wrong. So look at the good stuff as well as the bad stuff. The severe tropical cyclone Debbie, as it came in March this year, it was coming in as a category four system. So a very scary event, coming in towards the Whit Sundays and across the other beach. It was doing a lot of dog legging around, trying to work out where it was going. The Metmere was trying to work out where we're going. We're all trying to work out where we're going. At some point, it was looking at Mackay, where they were then looking at evacuating 25,000 people from the storm tide zone, and then did another dog leg and looked like it was coming back towards Townsville. 
similar idea with the set issues with storm side zone. Um, and then it sort of worked its way out and then came in across the early beach area. It was moving incredibly slowly. It was a, a very slow moving event. It hung over the, um, the Hamilton Island type area for about 12 hours, just slowly rotating then moving through as it pivoted and turned. So quite a very long, exhausting event for everyone inside it. We were able to get access the day after coming with the army and got out and did some inspections in the coastal areas. The cyclone still progressed through with flooding and winds to, to Collinsville and moved then tracked on inland towards the south. But we sent our investigation to the coastal areas only. Before the event, it was actually um, bureau anemometry in a lot of the towns around the area, so it had a really good idea of the wind speeds impacting the towns. But also, we've now got uh, these trailable anemometers that we can race out and set up in front of the event, so swell net. So we race down as the cyclone's coming in, we set these things up in pre release <coughs> locations with the councils. We run away, we let them do the recording and sending the data back in real time, which is then used by the Met Bureau and emergency services to have a look at what's happening through the town. But this is one of the events we've actually got a very good idea of the winds across the area. So from that, we can work out the wind map. And in terms of percentage of design for that 70 meters per second in open terrain, 10 meters height, we're looking at Hamilton Island brought the brunt of it, with it just being less than the design level for that area, going down to our cross pine, which is around about 75% of the design level. So scary stuff coming through these areas. But it was all less than the design level for modern buildings. So buildings built, houses built since the mid 80s, early 80s. So that was a, a good thing in terms of that. So you get in and do the, uh, the damage surveys. We work with uh, Queensland Fire Emergency Services with their rapid damage assessment. And this is cross applying. It's about um, 20 k's inland, 15 to 20 k's inland. And uh, all the green is basically showing no observable damage from the street. So if we pull away all the green and we can see what sits underneath it, yeah, we've got a lot of houses that have got minor through to you know, several that have got severe damage to them. So if we focus on the severe damage ones, predominantly all of them across the pine were to do with older construction. Things built since the 19, early 1980s with the big changes came into the codes. So it's, all, it's like the, the roofing is fixed to the old hardwood batten, and the hardwood batten is just nailed down to the, the rafters. So not screwed, not strapped. Um, in this case here, we've got a perfectly good roof that's come off. Um, it was doing okay, it held to the battens, but they did, when they replaced that roof, they didn't do the upgrade at the time. So the messaging that we're trying to push out and doing this retrofitting still isn't happening in terms of Queensland. We need to do a lot more because this was where, um, the major source of damage to housing. There is a lot of information out there, we need to keep pushing it out. And, and a lot of H 132 which is about upgrading older housing, um, a lot of that actually came from work that was done after Cyclone Tracy. We need to keep pushing that out. The other issue we had was also to do with, so these are fairly severe examples, but maintenance issues. So even in houses that are now built in the 80s and the 90s, there's issues of corrosion, especially in the coastal areas, rusting of the roofing, rusting of the screws, rusting of the tie downs, as well as termites and everything else. We're going to keep pushing the message to the owner, homeowners that the house is like a vehicle, it still has to resist, it will do its function when the wind loads are hitting it to take the load. So you've got to make sure that vehicle is still serviceable. So we need to get the house owners to really appreciate getting inspections done you know, every five, seven, ten years, just to get that process going through. So like a pest inspection, except looking at the other elements, corrosion, rot, that type of stuff. And just to highlight that, in terms of not just homeowners, this is a, a hotel motel on the main uh, street in, in Proserpine. It was hit by Cyclone Ului um, 2000, 2007. We did a damage survey through there and it, it lost its roof through that one. We turn up after the Cyclone um, Debbie and it's lost its roof again, so this time it's a new roof. And it's a secret fix, but I think, oh, they didn't put the roof down, well, there was issues with that. Since we test this product, we really wanted to look into it. So as we started crawling over it, we definitely see the roofing we peeled back but it was still attached to the, to the purlins. 
the Perlins weren't attached to the front of the building here. What had happened was, when they came and put the new roof on after Cyclone and Uluwe, they didn't look deeper into the structure. The main veranda posts where the carports were completely rusted through. It was just basically gravity that was still sitting them in the hole. So the insurers had paid for this brand new roof across it, but no one had thought to look down deeper if they did know we told anybody about it. So I was in the wind, came, picked up the whole roof, off about 14 of those unit blocks, just peeled it back across to the neighbours. Uh, and did, Thompson did, did actually more damage because it took the beams with them this time. So again, it's that message going through. Just don't look at the obvious one, we're going to follow that low path all the way down. Proserpine is an old town. So it was predominantly older housing or older buildings. If we go to Airlie Beach or Cannonvale, it's a much newer development through there. More touristy, newer housing, newer apartments, a lot of strata. So in looking at the rapid damage to survey, you've got a smattering of the minor, moderate and severe again. A lot of the severe here was to do with actually with flash flooding. So the high rainfall event filling up the gullies actually going through the culverts and going through people's houses. Pretty much all the minor was really to do with uh, water ingress, tree damage, that type of thing. In terms of the severe damage that wasn't the flash flooding, it was a lot of it was associated to with the verandas, awnings, overhangs. Because of the topography in Ellie Beach, everyone's got, well, people who can afford it, got lovely views. And to capitalize on those views, you have lovely decks or awnings or overhangs and everything else. Obviously, if you've got a lovely view, you've got a lot of wind speed coming at you. We need to be designing accordingly. But there was quite a repeated evidence on either timber frame, steel frame, masonry block construction, that those additional loads weren't being taken account of. So in terms of the designing or the construction, in terms of the masonry block here, there wasn't enough tie down going down through it. In terms of the um, timber veranda, the strapping of the, um, the, the triple grip plating wasn't enough for the wind loads going across it and just peels the elements right back. This is an example from Hamilton Island. It, there was a series of six units. They all had the same failure mode. Again, lovely view looking out. You can, the, the wind was severe. The, the trees had been smashed, no leaves left on it. So not a happy time for any of this. But the brackets holding the main veranda beams on had two rivets coming down through it. They're going to give the whistles around. And so you have a massive amount of uplift and suction on the top, pushing underneath it as well, peeling this thing off. So those veranda beams let go and then took the front of the house, well, the front of the units with it, uh, while people are still sheltering in there. So again, it's a lot of things around in terms of looking at the wind speed. We've, as Leighton talked about, the boundary layer profile. We're also going to look at what the wind does as it accelerates up the slopes. So we've got to take all the effects of topography into account. Now in 4055, it talks about the different types of classifications. So in terms of your classifications for your wind rating, basically the better the view you've got, the more wind speed you have. And in terms of if you're getting up to C4, it's really an exceptional case, and you should be looking at LS 1170 anyway. The other thing that the wind is doing is picking stuff up and throwing around, especially if you've got verandas flying around, we've got a flying derby going with it. The standardized test method is a 4v2, four kilograms, um, traveling now 28 meters per second. We do the test in Townsville at the station. Yes, it is a fun test to do. It's an old beer, that's a lot. In terms of debris screens, Again, we're trying to promote a lot more debris screens in terms of uh, you know, the towns or regions of the east coast around that, whether it be shutters or do it yourself ones or ones that roll the shutters or whatever else. Um, I'm not sure really how, what the take up here is in Darwin. They have a lot more take up in uh, you know, Western Australia than they have over at the east coast. This is a, a really good one from Exmouth. It's built away from the structure, so when it gets impacted, it can deform and doesn't break the glass behind it. So it's an excellent type of debris screen. Trouble was the front door blew in. <laughs> front door blew in, end wall and um, window, windward edge come off of this uh, kid house in Exmouth by the cyclone vans. So our doors are part of our structural envelope. They have to be able to resist the wind loads 
just like any other part of that clay. So standard entrance doors and standard entrance locks, with a whole door doors, you can't take the wind load. We're currently running a project at the moment trying to quantify that and get some more data out there for people. Because there's really nothing out there. You're trying to look at what the wind loads are. So wind loads are that, there's no um, data on door bolts. Lovely double door in South Ocean Beach, up to Cyclone Yazzie, very expensive house, beautiful view, big deck. The pretty little brass bolts, the drop and bottom, couldn't take the load as the wind pressure on the double door blew in and, and trashed the, the top floor with all the wind and the rain coming in and the huge insurance payouts as well. And it's not on just domestic construction, we have a lot of issues with cladding on engineer construction as well. These are all from Cyclone uh, Debbie in terms of you know, some feet linings, gable landings, end wall plannings, the brick face of the um, Proserpine Entertainment Centre. You may be able to point, see the, the brick ties through here fairly regular in spacing, but then they stop. There's no real holding down in that type of area. This is actually on the leeward wall. So as the winds come around, this is the suction side. So it's actually basically sucked the brick wall, the brick facade of that building down through the roof. This was meant to be um, a place of refuge during these types of events. And it's not just low rise. These are from Cyclone Marcia. By the time it got to Rockhampton, yes, Cyclone Marcia was again a very severe event when it crossed. By the time it got inland to Rockhampton, you're looking about Category 1, maybe Category 2 winds. Winds that are less than 50% of the design for these buildings. And yet these new buildings, one was six months old, one was about seven years old. You can see cladding hanging off the edge, complete loss of suffix on that one over there. So if we zoom in a bit closer and get up on the roof, you can see the air conditioning units knocked off, vents being blown off and ending up down, um, hitting buildings further down. All that edge of the roofing, it's a secret fix roofing seat being peeled back. But when you start crawling around it, because it came out in a lovely architectural um, shape of flying edge out there, very high suctions on it, but the flashing was incredibly wide. So it came across to match up for this triangle, flicks down there. It was hard than any fixing. You see more fixings on a house holding this thing down. So as the wing and the suction just picked it up and pulled the roof in with it, opening up the whole roof and, and letting more pressure into the structure. And basically pressurizing the ceiling uh, for the top um, apartments. So basically crashing the ceilings down across the whole top floor there. And obviously there's more rigorous and other things as well with it. There is currently no regulation for fixings of flashing, the design of flashings. So within 1562.1, which is currently up for public comment, I think it closes next week. We have put in there, or trying to put in, we've put in there issues on at least minimum requirements for the thickness, the material, the strength, and the minimum amounts of fixings that you must have for your barge flashings, your apron flashings, hip flashings, those types of things. So at least there's a line in the sand now that we can all start pointing to. Because after many, many different damage investigations, you many flashings were ripped off, and if there are any um, you know, $10 a metre to put on in the first place. From looking at insurance claim starter, you're looking at $700 to $1,000 a metre to replace that because of all the water ingress and other damage that flows down <coughs> through for apartment buildings. So the cost of having this thing done right the first time far outweighs the, the, the cost of the damage later on. But please, if you go to the standard site, have a look at that um, code there for comments. There's a lot of other things in there as well, not just that, that are out there for revision. Of course, you've got wind and um, debris flying around. We've also got wind driven rain. So, even in buildings that are still perfectly fine on the outside, people aren't living, aren't able to live in them afterwards. The whole place needs to be gutted. You've got water coming in under your sliding doors, water coming through your windows and your top story, coming down through the floors, through the ceilings, dropping everything down. So, it's trashing your electrics or everything else, the whole place has to be gutted. So it really adds to the stress of the people there and obviously a very much longer recovery period for the community around it. So one of the reasons that we're getting so much water coming through during our windows and stuff is that the test requirement for these areas, for our windows, is a tenth of the pressure during these types of events. So it's no wonder we've got water jetting in everywhere. So we've really got to start looking at how we can help to better control this type of water with it. We're starting to build a reef um, at, 
and the cycle of the testing station now says it's about a 2.4 meters high by 2.2 meters wide. And we've got these things called pressure loading actuators, which are kind of back in the from hell. They can actually follow the dynamic pressure traits that we can get from either the wind tunnel or full scale. We're going to start simulating these things on looking at the dynamic pressure pushing water through. So I hope we come up with um, some retrofit ways and work with the industry to push that through. So yeah, to conclude, the bad building performance can turn a storm into disaster. Good building performance doesn't make it newsworthy. The wind always finds the weakest leak, but all our test data regulations are not much use if not used. So we need to keep pushing with our product manufacturers to provide and promote better guides for our designers and builders to put it through. Thank you. On time. <laughs> Any questions for the lake and myself? <clears throat> Typical construction here is an open eaves. So we have a blockwork wall coming up, truss is on the top, 900 overhead, unwind, the wind can come straight in on top of your drip rock. That can't work in this situation. So as soon as we get a cyclone event, that drip rock's got to collapse and not going to build. But there's no Retrofitting or no, nothing mandatory about having an eaves line. We can have an open eaves. It's good for ventilation, I guess. Yeah. Um, um, and that's that, that, that years well, you need it. Yeah. The rest of the time you're going to live out, not build it. So, yeah, the 99.999% of the time. Yes. Um, yeah, that, that, that's up to where, where you're looking at between the trade off of balancing insurance costs. For, uh, the potential of damage because insurers are going to start looking at better risk profile for individual houses and designs as they get more advanced with this stuff against the, the living there for that 99.999% of the time at a, a more cooler, a lot better ventilated house. Uh, but it could be around different ways of looking at it. That's a better way of, of living with it. There's gyp rock systems that do have a waterproof backing on it or a water resistant backing I should say. And in terms of having our glue nuts at 450 centers or five, 600 centers, maybe we put them closer. Maybe we use some screw, more screws to, to boost that up. Or maybe use FC sheeting. And supposed to put a hundred mil of rock wall over the top of it. For okay, well, that's going to get really soggy pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? Have you done studies up in the Northern Territory in the islands uh, after cycling damage? Yeah, so we went up through um, Mindjalane and um, Cape Don after Ingrid went through. Um, that was the last time we were doing a damage survey. Was um, it the same sort of themes? Or with the ones? I know it's um, Some of the older, the older structures, it was again, uh, just hadn't been up, the, the pap straps went on or the, uh, retrofitting for some of the older housing. Uh, probably the predominant theme I, that really springs to mind was corrosion. Um, so I guess whether it would be the high humidity coming in and, and out of the vicinity of salt air, but a lot of the um, purlins on the industrial type buildings, uh, roof claddings, uh, internal, the galvanized straps, the straps are tying down rafters or the pre-made trusses to the top plates, a lot of that was heavy. And you can see that they have been done because there was multiple layers after one's got in through that put another one on the top and gone through like that. So there was a... Corrosion is one that really sticks to mind. Yeah. How are the stores? Uh, uh, um, what percentage of uh, destruction is caused by garage store failure? Um, okay, I can give you some numbers in terms of um, Cyclone Larry and Cyclone Yazi. Uh, both events were kind of similar, except Cyclone Larry is much more con constrained. But very narrow event with similar types of heat wind suits when it's crossing the community. You had about failures in the order of about 30% of, of garage doors in both industrial buildings and domestic construction. So it was, and that led to obviously water ingress, pressurisation, and just being trashed by the wind. Plus, in some instances, with the door being flung out itself, so smashing the roof and then smashing the neighbour's place as well. Um, it was after Cyclone Yazi that the ABCD got really heavily involved. We were able to work with the garage door manufacturers to come up with a very big revamp to the, the standard. So there's actually now new testing processes and design criteria, 
and it's in the NCC that for cyclonic regions you must have a win rate of door to that standard for 505. Um, it doesn't help if your house is older than 2012, but in terms of that, I'm not sure what would happen here, but if the door is being replaced after a event like say Cyclone Debbie, they, look, they have to be putting back a new win rated door, which also means they have to look at upgrading the structure around it because a new wind locked door needs a good stroke bus mulling and everything else to hold on to for it to take its wind loads. Um, roof decks that have survived a cyclone, are insurance companies interested in replacing those roof decks because they've used up a bit of their retained life? You've been reading my emails recently. Um, <laughs> it's an interesting question. We've talked about it for the old yeah. people around here. And it would have less um, resistance to cyclonic loading in the next cyclone. Yeah. If I was an owner, I'd be asking the insurance company to replace my roof deck. I, I, guess they, I guess they're lucky that you, the owners aren't you. Um, <laughs> what it is looking at though is if there's any form of damage across it. So if there's been debris hitting and dinting it, they'll be looking at replacing that so it's an obvious damage to it. Where it's really getting quite grey is if they're looking at the laps and there may be some stretching of the overlap. And now there's talk about, well, was it the wind load that was causing that overstretching? Is there some plastic deformation that has commenced there? Or, and the other argument goes, was the roofing just stretched out by the roof we're putting on in the first place just so it gets a bit more coverage to it? So, and there's aspects around that. So it's really looking at the orientation of the roof, where it was it in relation to the cyclone. So that conversation is happening, I guess, more with some of the more the educated owners or the ones that can see, or the roofers that can see some form of physical damage like a separation of the overlap. And that leads into, well, why is it happening? You haven't sort of collected any roof samples that have passed and taken back to the lab and do it? No, but we've, we've got them. that call out to a couple of the roofers to it. Um, but it, just with the variability of the material anyway, it'd be very hard to collate it that way. But what's more interesting to us is getting some time to look at a lot of the anemometer data that we have. Because if we put it in the parks around a lot of these houses in Proserpine and Bowen and places like that, at roof height, in amongst the community. So we work with the council at permanent acres, we drop up, put these things up, and we're measuring at a higher frequency that the Met Bureau does. So we're trying to look at the really gustiness and turbulence in amongst the houses and relate that back to our load cycles from you know the, the low high load test and things like that to it. And, and look at it that way. To see is the low high lows conservative as we think in terms I mean it's gonna take several events to collect a, a real library of this stuff or we can lay it back but that's that's what we're doing for that one. And that is also in your photographs um, there seems to be a return to secret fixed roofing which sort of apart from panel that here got thrown out of that um, years ago. Yeah. Is it a resurgence of that sort of product? Um, and it seemed to fail pretty hard to see so. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if it ever stopped <laughs> in um, where I'm from. Uh, it's still been fairly common for a lot of the commercial type structures. Um, I will say though that after we went, we used to it used to be tested by using airbags and placing it. But now when we went to about 15 years ago, went to air chambers. So it wasn't like a membrane underneath it. You actually have free dynamic air testing the product, and the failure loads that you're getting out of it were much less than when they were being tested with the airbag. So it looked like the airbag when I was pushing on the cladding was actually restraining it from moving and it didn't allow it to open up and open up over the clip because of the pans humping up that. So with the air box, it really seemed to have brought the failure mechanism pressures down. And if you notice from, from now looking at product manufacturers literature, the load span table is very different from say 20 years ago. And going through all that, I, in terms of a modern secret fix system, I don't think we found any failures from Cyclone Debbie. And that one on Cyclone Master that I showed, it was the, the flashing being the issue, not the cladding in that case. But I, I do agree, but with secret fix cladding, especially the older ones, yeah, you'd see it scattered everywhere. So, yeah, sorry. On, on the topic of, of red cladding fixings, uh, it, it was common in Queensland years ago to not use cyclone washers. Is it still the case, or has Queensland brought up the NC? Um, no, we haven't caught up with the NT. Um, look, with cyclone assemblies, when we do the testing for it, you can do your load span tables that you don't require. 
So if it's a single story house, or even a double story house in a C3, so in amongst the suburbs, you can, within the load span tables, you don't need cyclone assemblies. If you put that same house on the beachfront, on the side of the hill, yes, you're going to need cyclone assemblies for that same batten span. The good thing with cyclone assemblies, regardless of where your house is, it just, A, it gives you more capacity, obviously, but also helps cover up a lot of sins. It doesn't take much to greatly reduce the capacity of cladding by having that screw just a little bit off-centre on a crest by slightly on an angle because that load concentration is down under half of that screw head now. So you're doubling well, square to it, the, the, the stress concentrations under that area. Whereas the, the cyclone assembly, if your screws are a little bit out of whack, it cover it, you know, it helps ameliorate that um, not perfect installation. So yeah, I have cyclone assemblies. <laughs> but, uh, taking that one step further to the oh. compact button that fits into the truss, <coughs> that screw head doesn't always hit neatly in yeah. that valley yeah. of the top of that Yes. Is there any noticeable failure <coughs> that you saw from that? Yeah. Okay, I haven't seen in, the, in terms of a damage investigation, but in terms of testing in the lab, uh, you, you know, you've got your top hat batten coming down. If that screw is coming down and that screw head scores, the edge of that batten and it's it, that greatly weakens the performance of the batten. Same again if you put the screw on a stupid angle and it's cutting it on the head as well. But it's really, and that's what you expect if you're looking at it. But what people may not expect is that as that screw is coming down and it deforms the wall of the, of, of the, um, the top hat, that doesn't do any good. So yeah, so good, good top hat battens have enough width in it. And I, I think a lot of the good ones also have that double little rib on there, so it does help center the screw away from the edge, and a few things like that, and also helps strengthen that foot going through there as well. So all those little details and bits and bobs on it do help the performance of those systems. But again, it's like <coughs> getting that information before putting the screws. Yeah, in. yeah, and and that's where we really need to work with the manufacturers and certifiers to keep that message going through as well. And stuff for being important, it, all, all that important stuff doesn't get through. There's no real ownership to it, it's just dropping in. We see that sometimes they've got photocopy. Well, actually, it's probably not an issue here because you've done the DNA fly, but that's where I'm from. Um, you have a lot more non conforming products coming through as well, but to be a, a bit of concern around that, well, more than a bit. Just following on from Neil's roof deck issue, um, the, the roof deck is visible, the roof patterns underneath are not, and we test the roof patterns below by low for the, for the design question. But we haven't got a haven't got the data on you know ten year old roof battens which have been exposed to corrosion and humidity and salts versus you know the pressures that they're supposed to take now you know five years time can they have the same pressures to can today? Yeah. Uh, if they really, I, I don't think there's an issue in terms of the loading on it if they haven't had any past event. But the issue around corrosion is one so. There is an example after Cyclone uh, Yazi. There were some houses along the beachfront there at Mission Beach, and the Safites were, were poorly fixed and sucked out, and the, the you know, wind pressure and rain got in. But what it did expose was the leading edge roof battens. So you can now see them from under that. Even though they were nominally sealed by the eaves lining, the fascia, the roofing, obviously there's gaps and everything else, there was corrosion that was happening already. And these were houses around seven years old. So it's again coming back to the designer and the builder knowing that, yes, I've got a, uh, my zinc balloon roof batten there, but really if I look at what the product manual is telling me, I need a better corrosion system because I'm on a beachfront or I'm on the first row of houses in. So corrosion is a huge issue, especially when we can't see it. So we really need to be pushing a lot more durability or things that are difficult to replace or paint or whatever else or, or even observe. So that, that is going to be a real issue for our... Especially, you know, we've got houses that are, are, are better life safety after the 1980s, designed to much better standards than previous. They're now, like me, middle aged, you know, probably beyond middle aged, but they're getting, getting a bit wear and tearish. So, but the owners don't really appreciate that. So we need to get that more out there. Um, is there anything else? We might go have some drinks and food, eh? And keep chatting after that. Do you want to keep continuing? <laughs> 